All right. Hello and welcome to Man's Model Moments. Midweek, midweek moments. So, um, sorry, I've just taken a drink just uh, just before we came on, just trying to get all my stuff together because I had to clear this all out and yeah, the usual, the usual bits and uh, bits and bobs. So tonight I am uh, going to be building, or at least starting the build of uh, this, the Tamiya F15C. But as I haven't been on for a while, I thought I'd also kind of give you a quick appraisal of, of where I am. I just need to sort that a little bit. That's not quite straight, is it? Yeah, that's a little bit better. Uh, yeah, so I'm in my bedroom because it's a lot warmer than being out in the shed. I, I re relocate. Um, well, uh, that depends, actually, because um, we may have to move, um, which is a, a, another whole set of things, but um, I shan't bore you with. But a lot on at the moment. Um, it's a busy time of year, obviously. Had the ICM catalogue video. Uh, went up last night. Um, some nice comments on that. Um, I think ICM have got a really nice set of releases for the year. I really like the way that ICM are doing a lot of kind of not super unusual, but kind of just a little off the mainstream peripheral kind of kits. Things like that chapel, the mobile chapel, you know, it's a very simple kind of adaptation in a lot of ways of a standard military vehicle. Um, but I think it just shows, you know, that, well, people are people, right? And we think of wars as these dim and distant different things that, you know, are very far from us. But I think, I think it was first brought home to me during the Kosovo conflict um, when you saw people in, at the time, modern clothing, you know, modern civilian clothing, mm -hmm kind of fighting in shopping centers and stuff and you think no this is just it's just people it's just conflict it's not something that is a million miles away you know everybody thinks it's many miles away until it arrives at your doorstep like it did in ukraine so i, I think all of those things um add a bit of interest at the kind of more human side so i like the fact that icm are doing those those uh, sets and 19 new tools is you know a tremendous amount even if you look at okay a couple of them were vietnam matting you know and you think well that's not much and it's like well it still requires design it still requires a piece of steel um to be machined uh, and made you know the cost of that is still substantial um and even if you look at it taking all of those other things out there's still like seven complete kits you know ignoring all the figures or so 10 different figure sets all new tools so I think it's tremendous. And as I said in the video, um, if ICM and FX were one company, it'd be a really rounded release because the ICM release almost completely ignored 170 second scale. The FX release was almost completely 170 second scale. So they kind of go together quite well. So I think as modelers, you know, we should be really thankful that, you know, every year we are getting this level of quality and this number of new tools. Um, whereas the likes of the traditional companies, you know, Ravel, even Tamiya aren't putting out that volume, um, putting out very good, good tools. Um, and again, you know, that's adding to, to what we have, but in terms of showing you some of the other stuff that I've been, been working on, oh, this is a big box, um, not the original box, but, um, one of the, I haven't done a Ravel kit for a long time, and I thought it was about time I, I redressed that balance. So um, this is something I've been, been working on. This is the, the Mandalorian N1 Starfighter. So it's the, the same kind of Starfighter that was in the prequels, um, but obviously more stripped down and uh, repurposed for the Mandalorian after Razor Crest was destroyed. Um, it's quite a nice kit. It doesn't have the finesse, I wouldn't say, of the modern toolings from ICM or Airfix or Tamiya. 
and they have done some very stupid things, which I'll cover in the video. Um, well, it's no surprise. Uh, I've got an unboxing in this that will come out soon. They actually printed, like in raised detail, the logo, the Revel logo, uh, the Revel logo, and copyright 2023 on the outside of the hull of what is supposed to be a bare metal like silver aircraft uh, well spacecraft what were they thinking i mean it's just it, it blows my mind the kind of uh, level of idiocy i mean yeah fine put your put your copyright on put it on the inside where no one's going to see it come on um but it's going together very well um it's got quite a nice cockpit um that's no, not the cockpit where's the cockpit <laughs> I think I actually put the cockpit. Uh, yeah, a lot of it does go together. Kind of, you could just snap fit it in. So these pieces, for instance, it's kind of the part of I don't know, some techno babble stuff, um, engine piece before, but that kind of goes in quite nicely. Um, pieces of the cockpit um, have nice decals to go on them. Oh, I've got it to hand there. So. One of the things I'm, I'm looking forward to is doing the, the outside because it is, as I say, all metal, but different metals. So it can be interesting to do that and get some, some scorching effects on the metal for the engines, for instance, things like that. So that's quite an interesting one. A couple of other things that I have here are, it's not that, it's this. Well, these, and you'll probably have seen these in some other people's videos. Uh, these are the Galeri brushes. So this is their, I think their standard one. This is their, their premium one, which actually I really like. Uh, it's got these little cutaway pieces here, uh, which are quite nice to, to have your fingers on. It's got a little bit of kind of gold brass bit here in this sort of twirled cutout. So that's quite nice. It's quite, quite nice action. I thought rather than do just a standard review of these, I've actually got my trusty cheapo fender brush and my accursed um h and s evolution <laughs> i say accursed just because it's cost me a lot of money and i haven't had the results that i expected from it uh, and i've also got a mr hobby uh, 0.2 millimeter brush um, i'm just waiting for a new needle for that so I thought I'd do a comparison between those because um, I think the Fender ones are 0.38 and 0.3. No, sorry, the Galeri ones are 0.38 and 0.3. The Fender one is 0.3, and then I've got the 0.2, and then I think the 0.3 is also in the H&S. So it should be a, a good comparison of sort of like around the 0.3, and also showing the comparison with the 0.2 millimeter, which I think should be good. Okay, uh, just having a look at the chat because I haven't so far. Uh, so firstly, good evening everybody that uh, has said hello specifically. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, always a pleasure to, to have you with me. I've kind of got, it's difficult to explain, around here um, in my side, line of sight, um, you won't see it, is an aluminium bar that goes across my screen about three inches from the top, uh, which actually houses my two lights. Let me just show you, actually. Okay, there we go. You see the two lights there? And they go on this aluminium bar there. So I will be moving the camera to that to actually look down when we get to that bit in a, in a couple of minutes. But if I'm kind of dodging around, it's because I'm trying to see past that bar. I had to change my setup here. Uh, so just looking through, I, I will try not to shake the box. It is all bagged, so I'm fairly confident that I'm not going to be smashing all the pieces before we get started. Um, I mean, people say that to me, I just shake the box and it's made, right? So... Uh, Okay, just bought the Memphis Bell. A gentleman told me once this new third and final movie comes out about the XB17 division, you won't be able to find a B17 kit anymore. 
I'm sure it doesn't matter how many things they make about uh, World War II uh, and whatever aircraft it is, you'll always be able to find kits of things like the B-17. Uh, I like the idea of an F-16 as a cheaper, lightweight fighter than the F, I presume, 15. Cheaper on gas and maintenance. Yeah, but it doesn't have the range or carrying capacity that the F-15 does. So the F-15 and F-16 complement each other pretty well. Um, so a lot of you will know that I follow a channel called Grim Reapers and also another one called Growling Sidewinder. Um, in a game called DCS, Digital Combat Simulator. And they do a lot of stuff about um, a lot of fights and war games and things with F-15s, F-15s, F-22s, whatever. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages to them all. You know, if you really know what you're doing in an F-14, you can hold your own against some modern fighters if you can, you know, certain conditions and everything. Um, but they were all designed for different tasks, right? So... Uh, I think the arguments about, oh, this is better than this, it's just like, well, what are you comparing it to? Is it in a BVR fight? Is it, you know, BVR with AWACS cover? Um, is it an intercept mission? You know, there's horses for courses, uh, as you were. Uh, <laughs> why don't matter? manufacturers will never settle on a common scale? Um, so, I mean, we have 172nd scale. Um, which seems to be the, you know, the standard for sort of warbirds and uh, World War II bombers and stuff. But then 148 scale gives you a bit more scope for detail and a bit more to work on, especially if you're older and you get that, you know, loss of short vision um, and not as small parts, obviously. Um, 1144 is good for bigger aircraft like commercial aircraft. Um, then you've got one one hundred, which is sort of a balance between them. Manufacturers will never actually come to a, a common consensus. I mean, it hasn't happened in railway modeling, right? You've got N gauge, you've got double O, you've got H O O O, um, you've got T T now as well. So it's it's the nature of people to all want something slightly different. And I think that's absolutely fine, right? But I think with sci-fi stuff. You get some bizarre scales like that is i can't even remember what scale the the mandalorian one is but um it looks about on 48th ish maybe 132nd um but sometimes you get like 156th or on 128th or you know there's just a whole bunch of weirdness i think they just do the size to whatever they're thinking of. So if you think of the Ravel Star Wars ones, which are a little bit smaller, they're all seven pounds. So the Star Destroyer is like one twenty-eight thousandth scale or something, you know. So that it's about the same size as a snow speeder in one fifty-six, and then a, you know, uh, what is it, the X-wing in one eightieth or something. It, it's a whole mess, you know. Uh, Bolton is a long way from where I live, but Ms. Modeler went to Bolton uh, IPMS and has a video up on that. Uh, so you can check that out if you didn't manage to, to get there. And indeed, Fenris, you are correct. Bandai Star Wars stuff is generally 172nd scale. So... But that does mean that some of them are really expensive. So the Millennium Falcon, the Bandai Millennium Falcon on 72nd scale, is a lot. It's a lot of money. <laughs> so speaking of different scales, one of the other things I have been working on is uh, this beast, the old gannet in Australian markings. Um, so... This has had a bit of a, so I've got it with the open Bombay. Um, have yet to put all of the the pieces on, but the weird thing is that this is all painted, right? And it's got, I've done all the panel lining and everything on it. I had to make decals for the, um, the Australian markings, these uh, markings, the Navy, the big M, shows it operated from uh, HMAS, think it is um 
Melbourne. So you have that, that's all painted. And then I have this box, <laughs> which contains all of the other pieces, like the, the wing folds and stuff. These are also all painted and panel lined. Um, and now I have to put it together. It feels really weird to be putting together a kit which is almost finished. So it's really, really strange, you know, having all of the, the propellers with all the decals on and everything. Um, and just having to put it all together. But but I kind of got... Uh, I was ahead of Sully on, on his. Both doing the gamut at the same time. He's finished his now, because I had a bit of a big pause for mine. Um, and his video will go up shortly. Uh, he's done his as a, a kind of uh, recovered, disused one, so it's really heavily weathered. It looks absolutely fantastic, so be sure to check that out when that goes up. Um, I actually have a little, it's like an old Verlinden card carrier deck um, that I'll be mounting mine on. So very, very different kind of um, representation of the same model, um, which kind of, kind of quite interesting to see the two, two different ones. Uh, so that's kind of some of the things I've been, been working on that I wanted to just uh, bring you up to date with. Uh, before I get into the F-15. But I think that brings us to the good old box. And I'm now going to shift over this. Oh, okay. Now, I'm not exactly sure where this goes now. There we go. Okay, it's a little bit too close. But yeah, if I have it there, it won't quite right. We'll see how we go. <laughs> we'll see what we actually can uh, can see. So typical Tamiya kit, With the old fold out instructions. I wish they would convert to a book, but Japanese companies tend to stick with what they know. Right, let's get a bit more light here, shift these round. Bear with me, because I've got to move my mic, so there might be a little bit of noise. Okay. All right, and we have the plastic. Probably won't be needing that to start with. Clear parts and whatever the hell those are. Hmm. I'm not sure what uh, those metal parts are. So this is quite an old kit, but um, still a Tamiya kit, still got some quite nice detail here. And this is a bit of a, a mojo build. Um, so in terms of in terms of what this is, it was uh, a bit of a, a discussion um, in a group of us talking about mojo builds and about um, getting back into to modeling in a new year and stuff. Um, and uh, which is why I'm not filming this. I don't want to have the, the stress of going through all of that and editing video and things. This is just a bit of fun, which I thought I would uh, share on the channel. Because a live build is, is very different from making a video, I can tell you. It's a lot less stressful. Which is bizarre, because you would have thought doing it live would have been more stressful. Um, but it's actually not. Uh, that looks quite a nice decal sheet, actually. 
So a lot of people don't like Tamiya decals, but um, you know they do tend to be quite, let's call them robust. But these don't feel too bad, and they actually look very well printed. Some nice instrument panel detail there. So we'll have to see how those those turn out. So yeah, this isn't um it's not what you perhaps might expect in a 2020s kit, but you've still got some decent, you know, decent level of detail. And I think this is the kind of ideal thing for you know, if you just want to build something that's going to look decent um, without having to, you know, get out your photo etch and go to town and all that kind of stuff, then one of the older Tamiya kits is always a good go-to. You know, you know you're going to get decent casting quality. You know, you've got nice crisp molding across all of this. Yes, it doesn't have the finesse of a kit, you know, like those ICM kits that I've been showing recently, or a recent Airfix kit like the Gannett. But it just shows you how far ahead Tamiya were back in the day. So let's have a little look. Now, one of the things, of course, with doing a live build is that the camera is in front of me, which means you see things upside down or I turn it around and I see things upside down. So I will do a mix, right? So that you guys can see what's happening. Um, but if I have to turn it around so it's upside down for you so I can understand what's going on, I will, okay? <laughs> okay, so standard kind of uh, start, getting the cockpit all together. Okay, so this is actually sidewall uh, by the looks of it. That sidewall at the back where you have all the the electronics. Let's start getting some some pieces off the sprue. So that's our, our main cockpit floor. B forty eight. You see, one of the things I think that um, Airfix have done very well, and actually ICM kits do this as well, is try to keep the numbering fairly logical for the start of a kit, you know, and use just one sprue. Now, I don't know whether this is going to be anywhere near the same, but... I mean, we started off with part B24, so we're certainly not, <laughs> we don't have, uh, you know, part A1 or anything. The interesting thing is, I often wonder if manufacturers build their kits with the instructions that they, they give. Because quite often I will depart, and you'll see this on my videos, I will depart from the order in which the, the instructions tell me. Generally, they're pretty good. But sometimes I just think, well, it's surely going to be easier if I do X, Y, and Z. And obviously you test fit to make sure that you're not missing anything. But I would have thought putting in the sidewalls at the same time as that back piece would allow you to get the right angle for this, because this isn't... I mean, is that the right angle or is it, does it sit up? You know, unless you've got a very positive location that you don't know, right? So, I mean, certainly I'll be cutting out those sidewalls and just test fitting them to see what angle that's at before I do that. Uh, here's the instrument panel. And I'll be taking all the pieces off for both these steps, really, apart from the really tiny ones, which I'll do at the time. And the other side wall here. Is that the other side wall? So this is this piece. Which is like that. 
Uh, this is the other side wall here. Hello, Peter. I presume it's good morning for you. <laughs> I'll show it again just uh, because you won't have seen the... Just just so that, you know, I'm sure we're showing good for the Antipodeans here. <laughs> Get a bit of those Australian roundels. And then we had those side walls. It's funny as well how different parts look sometimes when you've got the sprue the wrong way around. You know, I was looking for these pieces then. And then <laughs> this side is just like, where are they? Now, you see, this is what I meant about the, the angle, right? So this side wall here, once that is in, you know, it's absolutely obvious to see what angle that sits at, right? And it is not there, and it is not sitting straight up. So, you know, so it's, it's not exactly a bugbear I have with, with model companies, but just sometimes if you were only building stage one, you know, if you only had enough time, to just, I'm quickly going to just throw some pieces together, and you got that wrong, and then you came back, you know, even a couple of hours later, you know, to do this piece, and then this is at the wrong angle. Then, you know. Now I'm going to forgive Tamir because obviously this is an older kit. by the standards of its day, it's pretty exceptional, really. Of course, test fitting does tell you an awful lot about what is going on. It also means that you don't make big cock-ups that are hard to correct later. Not that you can't make cock-ups, it's just harder to. <laughs> now the control column. Where is the control column? I have to say, I don't have my sexy dogs on at the moment. So I'm a little bit struggling here. Let's see where that is. That is B8. Ah, it's there. Okay, I think I'll leave that on the sprue for the time being. Where's B49? Oh, there we go. So this is the rear of that piece here. It has this cross hatching does have a pin ejector mark right in the center there. Tips on paint conversion chart. There are a couple of things I can say about that. Uh, one is the internet. <laughs> there are a huge amount of sites where people talk about, you know, what paints are equivalent to one another. The other is there is an app, uh, which oh, I've left my phone downstairs, um, which is available on Android. It's not available on iPhone. Um, unfortunately, I can't remember what it's called. If uh, John Alec or Fenris or somebody in the... Uh, 
uh, in the chat can remember what it's called. But there is an app which actually um, will convert a lot of these things. Now, the other thing I would say is, and I, I was actually thinking of doing a video on this, um, color accuracy is a lie, right? I think that will be the something like the title uh, of the video because, we, and we've discussed this on, I think, Apex and Chill and other things before, how a color is perceived varies on a huge number of factors. And if you're in the ballpark of, of what that color is, imagine you've also got to think about the scale and then you've got to think about the the weathering, the like different pieces of the panel, the material that it's made of, you know, all those kinds of things affect how you perceive the color of that. Um, and you only have to look at different photographs of the same subject, not just aircraft, but anything in different lighting, in different times and things, and they will look differently. So I would always advise you start with something that you think looks right. This is actually one of the things I did a video on it where I, uh, I've catalogued my, my paint collection, right? I have a series of paint chits that one centimeter long by, uh, whatever that is, five, is it seven and a half centimeters, something like that. And I've sprayed it. They're white, so sprayed white. And then I've got a gray and a black section and I paint all my new paints on that. Um, I also then scan them. Um, I use the same scanner for them also, and I scan them five times each and average the results. Um, so I can compare them and I do, uh, <laughs> and this sounds very obsessive because it is, um, I do an HS, not an HSV, it's an LAB um, um, scan of them. That's how I record the color, which is good for determining color distance. And then I can look at you know, which colors are close to each other. But even so, I eyeball stuff uh, and I will work on, you know, what I think looks right. I'll start with a, a darker color and then I will add colors in and then I will finish off with a lighter color um, to give depth of color. And, you know, if you look at how artists think about color and, you know, we are all artists in our own way. Um, but if you look at like how, let's say, classically trained artists or people, not even trained artists, but really good artists look at the way that light interacts with things, right? So when they paint something, they don't just paint a, a leaf green, you know, because light plays off it, you get pieces. And that, if you look, they'll use white, they'll use, you know, a base green, they'll use, there'll be blues and, you know, other colors in there. And if you look at volumetric painting, by mini painters, they do this a lot. And I think we have a lot to learn from those kind of things. So I would encourage you guys to watch videos of people like Marco Frassoni, um, Ninjon, um, there's a guy called Brent who does Goober Town Hobbies. You know, they do a lot of this. Uh, Brent is also a scientist as well. He's got videos on like um, super glue and stuff. So man after my own heart. <laughs> And thank you, John, for putting that. Hobby Color Converter is the Android color conversion app. So obviously you do have to start somewhere with something. And you want something that, you know, is in the right ballpark. But if something, you know, calls for US gold gray um, and you've only got, you know, army painter uniform gray and it looks a bit dark, but otherwise okay, then just add some white to it. <laughs> so I think we get far too hung up on uh, on color accuracy. Uh, I'll put that in inverted commas. Um, you know, if you were painting a full size F fifteen, then yes, you would need the correct colors. Um, but even so, you know, people who work on aircraft often say, you know, yeah, that's that's what specifications say, and in in peacetime, that might be the case. Uh, but again, different manufacturers might do things slightly differently. Um, in wartime, you know, yeah, there's a standard. We try and hit it, but, you know, we need these things out the door and fighting, not uh, stuck in a 
you know, an administrative or, or bureaucratic uh, death trap. Uh, so I just glued the side consoles in place there. Uh, and obviously I have to paint all of this, so I will be spraying it. So I'm not worried too much about you know, getting everything. And you'll see this actually on this build. If I show you the painting of it, you know, I will just spray this in situ. I'll do the weathering because it'll be what you can see, right? I'm not going to stress about getting all the pieces that might possibly be seen in exactly the right color. Because these pieces are, what are these? Uh, XF19. X. Oh my God, what have we got? Where are the paint charts on Timia? Oh, here we go. Right above, obviously. Uh, semi gloss black. Yeah, and the other thing, right, is. Um, You'll often see different things. You know, I've had people come into the shop and you know say, "Oh, have you got a gloss black? Have you got a matte black?" And have you, you know, it's just like I, I very rarely, you know, use different finishes. Um, I will use varnishes if I if I need to make something gloss um, or semi gloss, um, or if I've only got a gloss, I'll, I'll use a matte varnish on it to take it down. You know, I don't really care about. <laughs> <laughs> getting individual uh, gloss, semi-gloss, um, matte, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the only time I worry about that is making sure I've got a nice smooth surface for decals, you know. Now, having said that, this is going to be a bit of an arse to spray. No, I don't know. Hmm. Question is, do I leave these off? Or maybe, maybe I just do one side. Hmm. This is another one of those things with with aircraft, right? Especially if you just want to do a mojo build kind of thing, um, because on one side you think. I could just stick all of that and just spray it and, you know, but is that going to be more of a hassle and, you know, less mojo-y? Um, I think the answer might be yes. So this is why I'll often depart. So I'm going to leave that. <laughs> Put that to one side. I think that's a very pertinent point, Fenris. You know, we all have our own, and again, we've talked about this before on Airfix and Chill. You know, we all have our own style. You know, a, a model by Fenris, model by John Alec, model by me, model by Sully. You'll probably be able to tell them apart by the way they look. You know, Sully's will have a bird nest in it, for instance, and be very weathered. <laughs> but we all have our own styles, and that does come through in the same way that our handwriting does, you know. Uh, and some people's styles might be similar to each other, so they might be more difficult to distinguish, but ultimately, um, don't worry about it too much. Just it, this is a creative hobby, and you should just let that creativity, you know, work and do something that you're happy with. Not worry about what other people think. So, subsonic or supersonic? Well, this is not going to be flying, so we are not going to go supersonic. And I need to find the pieces. Which look like they're all in here. Okay. So we have. Okay, these are all identical C22, C21, and then B45 and B46 are separate. Good. 
So the supersonic shocks we do not need. Let's take those away. Put those for the spares bin. So what, guy, what are you guys excited about from the, the recent releases then? What do you plan on getting from you know, the FX, the ICM, the other bits and bobs would have been shown on the internet? Put it in chat what you are hoping to build. I personally am really looking forward to the ICM B26, uh, specifically in the flak bait. Uh, version. I think that's a really, really, it'll be a really nice kit. And Flakbait was a pretty remarkable aircraft. You know, I, I did a bit of research on it when I uh, saw the release and read up about it. And it's just like, wow, that thing went through, <laughs> through a lot. Uh, the Liberator from um, from Airfix as well. That's uh, definitely on the list. I do have an Academy Liberator as well. So that might be something I do side by side just to see what the differences are. So I'm just cutting off little. This is what I do when I don't know what to do. <laughs> Cut off little molding tabs. See, there's actually bad detail on this. Look at these wheels. It's quite nice. I mean, the the age and some of the simplicity starts to show when you look at things like the, the afterburner uh, ring assembly here. But, you know, that's inside the engine. And, yeah, you can go, you know, hell for leather, put um, etch brass and stuff. But... Um, Again, for a kind of a mojo type build, I think it's unnecessary. And even if you were doing, you know, I don't know what you call it, you know, a dedicated build on it, you're going to see that much, you know? I think that's a that's a fair call. I think um, I think the Marauder for me is the one that I again not an aircraft that I've desperately wanted to do, um, but again seeing the kit, knowing ICM, and then learning about flak bait, it's like that's kind of got me to that point. Um, you know, I always think if you've got a particular subject in mind it kind of makes it a bit more personal and I think that adds to it and makes it more sort of that you want to build it. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen anything that was just like, Oh my God, I have to have that. You know? Yeah. You see the Chinook is, is just not my thing at all. <laughs> I mean, helicopters, not my thing. Um, the Chinook, uh, maybe it comes because, you know, we see Chinooks all the time here. And it's just like the big noisy bastards um, that fly over the Salisbury Plain and around here. Um, and a transport helicopter. And that's for me, is like, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I understand why people love it. And, you know, people work with it a lot. And it's quite an iconic aircraft. So I get why people want a Chinook. It's just I don't. Um, whereas, again, you know, looking at the special operations ICM. Um, was it the UH or MH? I can't remember. I think it's the UH-60L, um, which looks like a big, nasty, angry insect. You know, that, that's kind of the helicopters that I'm drawn to, like the Apache, you know, that, that looks mean. <laughs> the uh, Kamov, the KA-52, you know, again, it looks it looks nasty. You know, those are the kinds of things that uh, that I'm more drawn to than, you know, the Chinook's too 
too nice looking. <laughs> it's too rounded. Ah, uh, now that one. Yeah. That mini art P47 did look nice. Um, see, for me, the Bulldog um, is, yeah, I'll pick up a Bulldog, not an aircraft that I'm particularly interested in. I'm sure it'll be a nice kit. Um, the Walrus I already have. Um, and that M3 that we, we looked at on Monday is just too much, too much for me. Um, but I will enjoy watching your build, John. <laughs> Yeah, the Belvedere. Yeah, you see, the 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 classics. I'm. Uh, I understand, but you know, I've got the. Um, what is it somewhere here? You know, got this little beast. Uh, already built the missile. You know, and it's not bad. It's not bad. This, uh, this goes together pretty well. Um, these, not all of these go together quite so well. <laughs> Three of them went together well. One of them you have to cut the locating pins off because they actually hinder you. And one isn't actually molded properly. So I've got to correct that, which is why it's stuck in this kind of state. And the, the Land Rover is... Uh, it needs some work. I mean... It looks quite nice when you've got it, but it, it wasn't simple getting it to that stage. And obviously it has no windows in, so I'm going to put those in. Nothing in terms of interior. So I might actually put a couple of seats and like a steering wheel in. Um, and it does need quite a bit of work on the outside as well. You know, and there's, you know it's just little sticks across underneath. It's, there's no attempt at realism there. But then it's not meant to, you know, it's meant to go like that next to your stuff to make it look good. You know, it was made in 1960, long before I was even conceived of. Um, so, and the Belvedere is a bit, a bit unusual. So I kind of get it, but I think you have to, to really love this subject to put the work in to make those um, classics work for you. Unless it's just a pure nostalgia build, you know, you're just like, oh yeah, I just want to relive that moment from you know when I was when I was a kid, which I also get, right? Anyway, I'm just chatting here and not actually doing any plastic sticky stuff. So I think B45 and 46 of these two, but I cannot for the life of me see which is which. <laughs> I might have to go and get my sexy gogs. <laughs> See, when I was talking about age before and losing that short, that short distance vision, I've always had very good. Uh, well, I've always had very good vision, but I've always had very good long distance vision rather than close up. Um, so, of course, as you age, your eyes get less flexible. So, your what it is is your muscles aren't able to. Uh, to move the pieces of your eye in a way that can, you know, bring the focus right in. It becomes much more of a strain. Um, now, I just made a mistake there. <laughs> because I just cut both pieces off the sprues. And I have no idea which is which. And there's not really a way to tell there. So I think I'm going to have to rely on the outer pieces giving me that information. Fortunately, these pieces are the same on both, so I can make these assemblies. But this is what happens when you don't pay proper attention to what you're doing, you see. Did I say that life builds were less stressful? Just disregard that. I was talking rubbish.
yeah, rigging is um, it's one of those interesting things because it, I think so many people dread it. Um, I don't think it has to be that bad, especially with a lot of the modern solutions we have now. Um, but I think the the idea of it is um, you know puts so many people off so many models. Um, you know, the World War One, the interwar biplanes, um, ships, of course, are the, are the big one, and that does put me off. But for the biplanes and stuff, I think the rigging, once you've got the rigging done on, on a biplane, it looks fantastic. I think the main thing for me is then you really need to put it in a display case um, because dust, trying to dust a model that's been rigged is hell. Uh, and you don't want to have to do that. <laughs> yeah, the UH-60, 148th, and an Apache in the stash. And, you know, I've, I've thought about doing an Apache. Um, there's, <laughs> I'll tell you a story about where we used to live. I used to live in a place called Marlborough. Um, again, near the not far from the, the Salisbury Plains where a lot, the army do a lot of their exercises. And we used to get an Apache, and we lived in a, a farm cottage, right? So there were literally two houses. There was, like, uh, well, say three houses, because ours was a semi with our next door neighbor, and then there was Keeper's Cottage at the back. So just three built, two buildings, three houses, um, and then the farm. And so the, the Apaches, the Longbow Apaches, when they came over, um, and the army were training on them, they used to use us as a navigation point. <laughs> um, and they used to practice going down, because we had a lot of the Savanac forest and stuff around us, we used to be. Um, so they used to practice, you know, popping down tree level, popping up, you know, doing their, their attacks and stuff. Um, and they used to use our house as a navigation point to go around, which was great. So I got some fantastic shots of Apaches and used to wave to them, you know, when they came back and everything. Um, but yeah, got some really good, I mean, that you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of one of those things, um, you know, how low they can get and how accurate some of their fire can be. No worries. That's, um, you know, you've you've given the time, your time to come here and uh, share in this with me. I'm more than happy to answer people's questions. I can't guarantee I'll have all the right answers, of course. Um, I am fallible, as my ethics video showed. I missed six kits on the ICM video. I did correct that. I have put a link to that in the pinned comment mentioning it. Um, the FX uh, release is still light on last year, even the pre-announcement. So, and uh, I think all the, the feeling and comments about it still stand. It's just yeah, the, the depth of the of how light it was isn't quite as bad as, as I initially thought. But um, yes, we are all fallible. Uh, Mini M3 only has sixty one sprues. Oh my god, <laughs> that's that says a lot, doesn't it? Sixty one sprues, and you know that some of those are going to have. Dozens and dozens and dozens of parts on madness. Marlborough is actually a really nice town, um, but it's hell to park. It's an old market town. It's like one long, very wide street, which then has a central bit that has parking on now. Uh, but it's all paid for parking. It's quite expensive. It's very middle class. Uh, Marlborough School as well, of course. Um, was it Princess Beatrice and stuff? They went to school there. Um, it's a private school, which in in the UK is a public school. It, it, don't don't ask. Um, so they go around in their archaic Harry Potter robes uh, all the time. Um, so it's 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 nice. It's a nice part of the country. You know, one of the things that I love about uh, the southwest is the, the countryside. You know, you don't. Have to go more than five minutes to be in the countryside, basically from anywhere here. Excellent. <laughs> so.
So I'm guessing your daughter is pretty young then, Thomas. <laughs> I remember those days. I don't envy you. I, uh, I'm glad I went through them myself, but I'm glad they are behind me as well. <laughs> Best of luck with that. Father's leave for the last month. Are you looking forward to going back to work? That's right. <laughs> I know I, I used to uh, work away a lot. Um, so uh, so I got a, a regular break from um, from my little ones when uh, when they were young, uh, which was nice because, you know, you'd miss them when, when you're away and they'd miss you. And then when you got back, you know, it was always a big kind of thing which again was nice and of course you know i got nights in hotels um, obviously the company's expense um, so i get a good night's sleep so uh, my long-suffering ex at the time um, covered all of that for me <laughs> right uh so it says b ah okay there we go do you know, I am going to have to get my sexy gogs, guys. I do apologise, but you're going to have to bear with me for two minutes while I just pop downstairs because they're on the kitchen table. Um, I actually used them for measuring some... <laughs> this is going to sound weird. Some sprue gates. Um, you know, these, these pieces on, on some models, um, which is why they're downstairs. So bear with me. I shall be back in two minutes. And we're back with Sexy Gogs. I also took an opportunity to get a uh, to get a drink. Zero alcohol, so I don't uh, stick this in myself. Or at least if I do, it's my own fault. Right. Let's try and get this open. There we go. Okay, now I can actually see the numbers. I'm not quite as blind as this might appear. But the thing is, these lights, uh, it might not look like it, but they're actually quite bright. This one's a little bit. And uh, the contrast of plastic under them is not great. As in to say, it's, it's almost non-existent. Okay, now it's absolutely obvious. Be 41 and 43. These are not very white. Wow. I can just get my sniffers in there. I think if you had slightly beefier nippers, that might be a problem. So yeah, again, you know, we have faint ejector pin marks on the, the inside here. You know, and again, if I were really concerned, I might take a look at removing those. Let's have a look at what. Okay, so this works perfectly because obviously these are handed so I can tell which is which. So, again, manufacturers like Tamiya, you know, do give you all the tools so that you can uh, be less of a fuck up <laughs> if you're not paying attention. What 
what I don't like on these parts is this. That is that is not a good union. Right? It is just literally two blank faces. Which actually don't line up that well. That's a bit of an arse. Okay. So these pieces do need to be all very properly cleaned to make sure that you're not misaligning them in any way. I mean, these are going to require, I imagine, a little bit of filler anyway. But yeah, like here where we've got a little bit of of the ejector pin, not the ejector pin, the sprue gate. Uh, the reason I was measuring sprue gates, by the way, not, not something I do just, you know, to pass away the, the time. Um, I thought I'd do a video on, on what manufacturer, what manufacturer, what's the best manufacturer, basically, um, in, in present day, taking all things in consideration, which um, there's a lot to consider, you know, in what makes a good manufacturer. You know, it's not just what sort of kits do they produce. You know, it's how available are they, how much do they cost, what's the quality of the plastic. What do you mean by quality of plastic? You know, as I've mentioned several times, I'm an evidence-based scientist by training. So, you know, when you mean quality of plastic, how can you define that? You know, so thinking of, of what makes good plastic, you know, it is, uh, I mean, for me, how it responds to glue is one how well it is cast, how fine the parts are that are cast, how fine the, or how small the attachment points to the sprue are, uh, you know, how much flash is there, the sink marks, are there pin ejector marks in noticeable places, how big are they? You know, you can start to quantify this, but it does become quite a lot. So it's going to take a bit to do that video, but I think it would be interesting and certainly the results are interesting as they are at the moment. Uh, I've still got a ways to go with it. But the companies that you might expect to be up there are up there. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I doubt it's going to become as any surprise what I actually end up you know, saying, yeah, I think these are the best companies. What the order of those is probably going to be what people would you know, argue about, do argue about. But I think it's an interesting exercise to do it you know, a little less subjectively, a bit more objectively as, as far as it's possible. So this really is the only eject pin mark, this lower one um, that you will have any chance of seeing. And it is very shallow. There's just the edges of it. I'm not going to bother. Uh, filling that in for this build. You know, did a little bit of shaving just to reduce its um, prominence, but otherwise, I think that's fine. I do have it, so I'm not doing this in the in the original scheme. That is uh, that is one part of this. I do have a scheme for it. I'm going to keep that a secret until till the end. Hopefully nobody else thinks of the same one. Ugh. I did uh, <laughs> I did find one with uh, with a it's basically stars and stripes, the whole aircraft. I'm very disappointed that none of my American friends are going to be doing that. But, <laughs> but I do get why you wouldn't. <laughs> um yeah, that's the wrong one, isn't it? It's this one. <laughs> is that right? No, it is that one. Yes. Oh, what did I say about them making it hard for you to F up? Yeah, here I am. Fucking it up. <laughs> uh, so you will see on this and on my video, sometimes I will just put Tamiya 
extra thin or its uh, equivalent um, homemade alternative directly on parts and uh, you know it might look a bit messy but I can assure you when it evaporates and you've got uh, a coat of primer on there you will not see that um, so it is surface level even so those are not meeting up a hundred percent though yeah So yeah, the the fit of this piece is um, a little interesting, I would say. It leaves a little bit of interpretation. <laughs> so I would say to those of uh, you who might be thinking of doing this kit, just take care with this because it'll be easy to misalign these not much but it's a very prominent part of the f15 these big forward air air intakes there is quite a lot of play in those and they do not match up at all there yeah that is Definitely the weak part of the kit so far, the weakest part of the kit. So that's about as good as I'm going to get that, I think. Let's just go ahead and okay, put way too much glue on there. This is going to be one of those things that you, you have to glue make sure it's actually in the right place and then just leave it for a long time <laughs> till it's definitely set before you come back to it because if you start messing with this that's going to get misaligned very easily let's put that over there where i can't actually mess it quick drink Welcome from Seattle. Uh, kit number. That is a good question. It is. It's the 148 scale aircraft series number 29. In terms of a Tamiya number, Six one zero two nine. I'll type that in the chat. That is the item number. Uh, it is one forty eight scale. The uh, the, <laughs> the F fifteen is a big old bird. Now, I do have a, a 132nd scale. I, I don't know what kit it is. Maybe Academy? Um, I'm not sure. My, it's actually my father's kit. And uh, he did it. And he didn't want it. And, um, you know, when he finished it, and I thought I'd... Uh, I had a uh, an etch brass set for it. And I thought, well, I'll... I'll take it apart and uh, and have a go. 
and that was years ago and it kind of resided in the stash after a couple of moves and stuff um as these things do these projects kind of get put put to the side um and when this came up i thought oh maybe i could resurrect that and do it as a crashed f15 because the f15 although it has a perfect air, -to -air combat record it does not have a perfect flight record um no as with you know most operational aircraft it's had its fair share of crashes and as with a lot of us aircraft it's it's more dangerous um to itself than perhaps enemy aircraft are to it which is i think a, a mixed blessing let's say <laughs> So I did find one, and I thought, well, I could do that, which was an F-15, um, which had completely ripped its, well, it broken its its spine kind of just here. Um, so the front was broken off, the, the radome had come off. You could see the, you could see, well, you could see the radar dish because the radar dish had actually detached and was on the floor, but uh, it, was, it was a two-seater, it was a D. And then I thought, it's going to be an awful lot of work. And that's not really what I want to do. But I had this in the shop, so it was very easy for me to just uh, pull it off the shelf. That's an interesting question. Tumgiri are an interesting company. Um, I actually have quite a, quite a soft spot for Tumgiri. I think, particularly back in the nineties, they were producing some of the best value kits of really interesting subjects. So that's when they did things like the the X thirty five and the X thirty two. Which was for the joint strike fighter pro, um, tender kind of thing, competition, whatever you call them. Um, you know, they were doing modern aircraft. They did the Eurofighter and the uh, Rafael and um, Gripen, Gripen. Um, you know, their tooling was pretty good. Yes, they did make some. I'm specifically talking about 172nd scale, really, here. Um, you know, may not have been Tamiya level, but it was not Tamiya level pricing either. They were really cost effective. I feel that they have... They've improved. But they haven't improved as much as, as some of their competitors, like Airfix, for instance, right? But they are asking uh, <laughs> Tamiya level prices. So that uh, Maki MC202 that they released was a really nice kit. But the RRP on that is like £119. And it's a 132nd scale fighter. And when you have the Airfix 124 scale Spitfire selling for an RRP of 95 and yes, you can pick up the, the Mackie. Uh, I think I sell it for is it 95, I think something like that. So you can find it under 100 pounds. Um, but then I sell the uh, fixed Spitfire for 85, you know. So, and if you look at it, it's a nice kit. It's got some really nice things about it. The decals, very clever. It's got... Um, you know, photo etch and stuff, but it isn't quite as good as the FX Spitfire. So I think they've got a bit of a, a mixed reputation. 
I have a customer in the shop who does a lot of armor who didn't he does he does a lot of shermans um his name's dan if uh, if he ever watches this hi dan <laughs> he's a great guy uh he uh, we had to talk about ferrets he he was actually training with ferrets in canada uh gave me some good stories about those the engines catch fire a lot apparently um and he did an atelier he bought an atelier and he's he's had a number of tummy kits off me um he really didn't get on with the atelier so um but yeah i've done atelier armor uh and i've really enjoyed it so i think it's mixed i think it, it obviously depends on what you're expecting it's a little bit of uh flash there keeps catching my thumb so let's just get rid of that while we're here there we go that one aligned better i don't know whether that was because i was aware of it but i don't know if you can see hopefully you can the two pieces aren't quite the same size this side is thicker than this side so it's definitely going to need some you'll need some trimming and sanding when it's when it's dry to make that look well not odd basically because of course there is no seam on the real aircraft in that part of the inlet it's also a rather annoying ejector pin mark right there Again, I'm not going to do anything about that because, you know, it'll be this way around. And I don't think many people are going to be looking underneath to see that. But if you were really going, you know, balls to the wall for this, then I think there's going to be quite a few sink marks that just need... They're only going to need a smidge of filler. But if you don't do them, the kinds of things that will pick up washes, you know, really easily. Let's have a look at the other Oh, God. Talking about how I had to be careful with it. I'm going to smash it against the table. Yeah, I mean, this isn't ideal, the way this is formed. But hey. Latest on the revised podcast. Um, so yes, if we do have the podcast, it is on YouTube now. So we have it on video. We had two specials. Um, at the moment, it time is the big killer. So uh, I have an awful lot going on at the moment. Um, unfortunately, my uh, my old personal life. I'm going through a divorce at the moment, which is dragging on a lot and it's consuming a lot of money uh, which is a worry um you know, i mentioned maybe having to move and again that is a, a money thing um so at the moment i am actually looking for another job um because the, the shop isn't making enough to to pay the mortgage so um yeah the, the podcast at the moment is it, it, sort of temporary hiatus i would say um but purely really down to time um so if you could go along and subscribe to the beyond the box podcast it is not monetized yet we've only got like 50 or so subs to that uh to that i should put the link on the channel really but uh, i don't have that to hand um It'd be great if we could monetize that um, so that it could actually pay for itself because at the moment it does cost to actually host the bus bus feed um, for the audio only. Uh, and we can get that, uh, that, that kicking again. Um, so at the moment, my YouTube channel is a priority because um, that does not a lot, but it does provide some funds. Um, whereas Beyond the Box, unfortunately, is a, uh, is a cost rather than a, a benefit. But, uh, you know, we definitely definitely will still be doing it. And it is easier to, as I've mentioned before, to edit video than, than audio. Uh, the audio can then go straight from that. Um, so it's still something that's, uh, that's around. We've done our specials for the year. 
uh, for the Christmas special and obviously the Nostradamus issue. Um, and we'll be uh, getting on with the next one when we have two moments of time to rub together. All right, so we have done the inlets, which proved more problematic than I expected. Ooh, we now move on internal parts. That's an interesting uh, phrase. Right. What internal parts are they talking about? Well, we have the inlets, or engine faces, I should say. Oh, a couple of uh, deflectors for those, and the main body. There we go. Get to open the third bag. Now I'll probably be streaming um, a bit more uh, with this build. Partially because I want to get through the build relatively quickly. And I do quite enjoy doing the live streams. Big old chunky pieces there. Again, there was some nice detail on um, like the front of these turbines. Again, not that you will see any of it. And everything else here is very basic. So this is really just to give you a a bit of a, a view if you were to peer down. I was always amazed. I'm still um, continuously amazed at how small aircraft engines are in relation to the actual aircraft. I mean, if you think this isn't even the entire length of the aircraft, and the the engine is you know, what, maybe a quarter of the total length. You know, it's amazing how much energy and power they put out. If you actually have a look, though, at the the casting on this, the actual fuselage itself. Yes, the detail in the the wheelbase is very basic, but again, this is a mojo build. It, doesn't, it is going to be sitting. It is not going to be available for inspection. I'm not going to have a mirror underneath it or anything, um, so I don't really care. But all of these pieces are really quite nicely and quite crisply cast that nice engraved detail this is another bit about you know quality of plastic it's like what is nice engraved detail what does it mean in terms of panel line thickness i think fenris had a a, a bit of a, a question on this and or there were certainly some comments on someone's channel i can't remember i remember fenris commented about it and said you know be good to see like Airfix and Tamiya panel lines side by side, you know, because to me, actually, I mean, current Airfix stuff, I think somebody was complaining about the depth of Airfix um, stuff compared to Tamiya, which I think is, if you're comparing current and current, it's garbage, right? Um, Airfix stuff, present day stuff is, is immaculate. Um, I think it's much more uh, instructive or useful to compare something like a Zvezda kit with uh, with an Airfix kit or Tamiya kit because you want a panel line to be nice and crisp right so that's about the width of a scalpel blade yeah and it's probably I would say 0.3 to 0.4 millimeter deep and that's a deep one Right, it's a quite a large one. Got these other ones here, which are maybe 0.2 millimeter in terms of depth. 
You don't really want it any less than that because otherwise, and how wide it is and how deep it is, is how well it's going to retain any wash, a pin wash, right? And how easy it is to rub that out. And if you look at a Zvezda kit, I'm specifically thinking of like the 90 Zvezda kits, obviously at the moment, um, it's possible to get the Zvezda kits at the moment, but I don't think you really should. Um, so I'm not talking about current ones, but they do tend to have what I would describe as soft panel lines. So you kind of have the almost like the outline of a panel line, but without any depth to it. So it's a little bit wider than it is deep, which means that when you're running, even if the wash is dry, right? If you're running a, a cotton bud or like a little makeup remover over it, it will pull the wash out. So all that lovely pin washing you do will be variable across the, the whole thing, which is not what you want. You want it to be nice and crisp and relatively deep compared to its width so that it retains that wash. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and put this in because there's no reason not to. So you can tell this is an older kit because there is nothing in the way of like trunking. <laughs> okay. A modern kit, you would usually get the air intake trunking. Whereas here you're kind of getting these pieces. <laughs> Just to show you kind of what goes on. Let's just see. No, nope, wrong way. This side. Okay. Okay, the fit of this is really, really okay. Yeah, it's not it's not immediately apparent how you're supposed to do that. <laughs> okay, and the fit of that is interesting. Okay, that that might need some some work, I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so you're getting a little plate back here to kind of guide it up, but they're relying on the fact that if you view it from this angle, you know, you just imagine that there's a wall here. <laughs> That is for you as the modeler to add if you wish. But yeah, I'm not really very impressed with that is such a vague fit. You know, it's like, yeah, it goes, you know, somewhere here. And there's, there's no positive locating at all. And to hold that in place when you're doing with liquid cement without getting finger marks on here you know even if you're wearing gloves is well, i suppose oh. yeah okay <laughs> interesting am i going to any shows or show my own kit off this year well um, uh, that depends. <laughs> depends on how the next few months go, to be honest. Um, I will be going to some shows. Um, I have a table booked at IPMS, um, Scale Model World, in November. Uh, I need to pay the deposit for that uh, by the end of this month. Um, but I won't be taking, like, it's not going to be a big stand with loads of models on because... Um, I don't have the margins in the kits to be able to take a load of stock down and be competitive with, you know, the likes of um, Wonderland and people and they who shall not be mentioned. Um, 
judge them. So I don't think there's a because people are going to a show are looking for something cheap, right? Looking for a bargain. And while I'm offering, I think, good value, you know, um, you know, I offer kits at internet competitive prices. Um, that's I don't think what people are looking for at a show. Um, so I'm not going there to make a loss. You know, uh, I'm going there primarily for advertising to advertise the channel, to advertise the shop, to show the kinds of things I, I do. So I'll probably have some of my builds there and stuff, maybe doing some um, tutorials and stuff. Uh, but, yeah, I um, I don't really do shows in that way. Oh, well, <laughs> good luck, Thomas. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, as, as Venris said. So... 78 with this boxing is a 91 boxing uh, with parts for the for the C. Okay, A4 and A5. Let's get A4 and A5 on there, those little... I don't know what we call them, really. Which is which? That's five. Five goes on this side. Oh, it really is just the floor. Okay. You see, that is such a positive fit. That is such a nice fit. You know, you could, you wouldn't even have to glue that. It just goes on. That's so nice. Which then leads me to wonder what the hell are they thinking with this piece? That's so inconsistent. I mean, you can tell exactly where and how it's supposed to go, but there's no positive location there at all. That's so bizarre. And it doesn't really do much for the... <laughs> yeah, viewed straight on, it gives you kind of an impression of the the tunnelling, but it's the barest piece, really, isn't it? It just shows you how much kits have come on. You know, and the kind of level that we expect now from manufacturers in our kits. Which I don't think is a bad thing, to be honest. Uh, this did start with the cockpit. Yes, it did. And I kind of stopped at that point. <laughs> Primarily because of this um, area in the back. To paint this, I think, is going to be a pain when it's closed up. Because it's curved in and you have these pieces, I think it's just going to be more relaxing for me to just um, paint it and then put it together. It's the gannet, you see, the gannet's done it to me now. Although, actually, I, I completed the entire... Let me just get the gannet. So this shows you how big the gannet is as well, how big the F-15 is. Big aircraft for its time. Um, so the cockpit here from... The instrument panel all the way through back here is there's one floor piece and then all these pieces go on you can make the entire cockpit in one i actually did that and spray it and then put it into the aircraft it's fantastic this not so much 
you know, even though that is more open, really, this piece is quite closed in. So, hence, I am leaving the, the cockpit uh, until I paint that bit. Because spraying that won't take very long at all. Uh, and then doing a quick wash. So I'll spray these. Um, I'll do a quick wash just to give some depth to this. Maybe a dry brush. Um, not necessarily in that order. Slam it all together. Um, here we've got decals for the, the side consoles. It all sits on this piece anyway, so that's quite an easy thing to do separately and then pop back in here. Okay. Can I get away with not putting the radar in? That is a question. I say that, folks, because I'm obviously not going to have the nose off. Because this is not that kind of build. Answer is no. I do have to put that on because it locates on that piece. Okay. Well, that answers that question. I mean, I won't actually put the radar in. I'll go in the spares, but this piece does need to go in. This is why you should always try these things before making decisions. <laughs> no. Things like this at the back here, these are actually quite nicely, nicely represented. I mean, these are obviously grills and things on the uh, various outlets and inlets on the real thing. But these aren't bad at all. You know, I really don't see the need for dealing with photo etch when you have this kind of detail represented. This has positive locating pins here. And then this, again, has a positive locating piece on this. Okay, I'm only just, I don't want to push it in and not be able to retrieve it, but that just makes these things even more frustrating. I'm not sure who the designer was who, who thought that this was an acceptable solution. I mean, there's even areas you could put little tabs and things to make this hit the right spot. Tamiya of old, what were you thinking? Anyway, I'm getting distracted. Go to the pieces that uh, should work. <laughs> I don't understand how these pieces can fit so well, and the other air in that pieces are. A real pain. Right. Now, of course, we can't put these things together. 
get that. Because I'm not putting the cockpit in. That's quite, you know, nice positive fit. Almost friction fits. Good. Just want to check. Put one of these in. answers one question it's possible to put these in after joining the two together is that going to make things easier that is the question possibly I think I'm going back to my original premise of do you think they actually build their kits with the instructions that they provide? <laughs> In the order that they advise? I'm not so sure. You know, actually, weirdly, they haven't put the ejection seat in. What point? Wow, they don't bring the ejection seat in until right at the end. Why? <laughs> that seems very odd. I mean, really odd. That's just bizarre. Okay. It's an interesting it's an interesting kit i might actually there any disadvantages to me putting that in position there before doing this i don't think so i don't think there is any issue with doing that. So I'm going to make that more of a pain to paint? I don't particularly think so. Hmm. Interesting build so far. Interesting. Maybe I, I'm, not, I'm not going to do that now. I'm not going to succumb to the temptation of just gluing plastic on for the sake of it. Does that apply to the bolts holding parts of the <laughs> side on, Sam? <laughs> After the recent, uh, was it 737 800 Max? With those blowouts that they had. So another channel I watch on YouTube is, uh, is called Mentor Pilot. 
and he is a I think primarily a uh, seven six seven pilot. Anyway, he's a he's a commercial airline pilot. Um, I think he's Belgian. Um, and he does videos on um, air crashes and incidents and stuff. Um, but in a very, I want to say respectful, kind of like a very analytical way. Uh, in a way, really, to give confidence in flying, not um, to sensationalize these things. Um, I'm just moving on to the wings because obviously I've hit a dead end with these. Um, I recommend going and watching him. He talks about you know, all of the fail safes that there are to prevent you know any sort of incident in an aircraft, and the training, and and importantly, you know, when there is an incident, what learning comes from it? You know, what changes do they do to actually, you know, make things safer to prevent those things happening again? And uh, it's really interesting. Well, I find it really interesting anyway. Um, and it does give you confidence in, you know, the, the way things are improved. Um, but inevitably, you know, when you look at an incident, um, it comes down usually to human error, you know, at some point. Even when there is a failure of some sort on the aircraft, it's because, you know, somebody at some point... I would say 90% of the time, 99% of the time, maybe, uh, you know, didn't do their job at some point, you know, a log wasn't filled in, you know, something wasn't reported properly, um, you know, somebody, some policy somewhere, some policy maker said that, you know, we'll do these extended service hours and things, and then they get missed, and, you know, it's always the human element which is the weakest link of these things. Which is why, of course, there are so many checks and balances, because people are fallible. OK, so we have some very positive locating lugs here, which don't seem to align. So I'm going to say that that's probably me as the human element getting things wrong. Oh, okay, there we go. There. Okay. Interesting, because that pin doesn't quite actually align the wing. To... Oh wow, it actually just broke this little little hole. Yes, the Swiss cheese model, exactly so. He, uh, he always talks about the Swiss cheese model. <laughs> yeah, so you have safeguards on safeguards so that, um, you know, for an incident to happen, it has to, you know, you have to have all these things align. So there should be gates in each. And it only has to hit one of those gates, right? Um, one of those gates will prevent an incident. Um, and also, you know, air flying is still the safest way to travel. It's it's less than a Six Sigma uh, event, any sort of air incident. Six Sigma being familiar, of course, to a lot of people in business. So you recognize Six Sigma. I've done a lot of Six Sigma stuff and the like. A lot of modern businesses use it to prevent uh, quality incidents, you know, to maintain quality of product. Uh, but it's also used, so it's used in manufacturing a lot, but it's also, so especially in the medical industry, which, of course, is what I'm kind of related to. Um, but it's been applied so widely now. You see, by complete contrast, that, that wing has gone together perfectly.
you know, there's a little bit of 1970s moulding there, but we'll ignore that because again, you won't see it. But that looks pretty good. So the only other F-15 I think I've ever attempted to build is the Hasegawa F-15E, the Strike Eagle, in the Charcoal Lizard camo. And um, it was one of the first kits that I used photo etch on, and I'd never finished it. <laughs> This, um, it was one of those kits that I did when I came back to modelling, and uh, I learnt a lot. But I learnt a lot whilst also kind of getting sick of the kit, particularly because of the photo etch, which I think is. I think if you're coming back to modeling and you know getting at that step up if you like for yourself you know becoming an intermediate modeler um i wouldn't recommend photo etch as being that entry point <laughs> some little pieces here just on the wing just getting rid of photo etch is uh is one of those things that i think adds to some models and uh detracts from others and the experience is usually painful sometimes literally um, usually figuratively okay that didn't have any of the issues of the other wing you know the slight misalignment and the force needed it is slightly see that that pin is a little bit vague. <laughs> I think that comes from kind of some of the design and tooling at the time. Sometimes they couldn't get the precision in the mold, so they needed to give you, I'm only talking about a fraction of a millimeter, but that little bit of room to be able to Know, align it if they couldn't get the precision in the molding. That's my theory, anyway. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Wings so far, definitely the least painful part of this build. <laughs> yeah, they were good. It's amazing actually how small they really are compared to the airframe. You know, you think about how big that is, which is why, of course, that Israeli F-15, um, when it ripped its um, wing off, Hitting the Skyhawk, it ripped it off about 12 inches from the root, about along here. Uh, it's remarkable if you see the photos, um, which is why it carried on flying, because it's got such a wide body, which actually can generate some lift of its of its own. Um, that if you fly fast enough, you can uh, you can fly it with one wing. But those are, I mean, look, the wing is barely well actually you know it's only the tip of it that's that's over the width of the fuselage that's incredible i mean <laughs> compare that to the gannet where the fuselage is 
incredibly thin and it's, it's taller <laughs> than that uh, the, it's about as tall as the wing one wing is wide and then of course you have two more sections of the wing it's got a very long wing again Okay, so we're coming up to the two hour mark. Well, I've only been doing this for about an hour and a half, obviously, because I was just talking for the rest of it. Um, but we've, uh, we've got a decent uh, amount of the way in. Um, oh, look, it's got sparrows. <laughs> they won't be featuring. That really does date it, doesn't it? Having sparrows rather than amrams. Terrible missile, the sparrow. Um, the sparrow, of course, was semi, semi-active, so you had to uh, to keep a lock to keep it on target. Whereas amrams, of course, are uh, fire and forget. So. Not exactly per the instructions, but we've got several assemblies, sub-assemblies there. These are horrible. <laughs> I would love to know if other people, uh, what other people think when they do this kit uh, about these ear intakes. Um, for me, that is a terrible design. I mean, the yeah. I mean, look at that. It's, it's just no, no idea where that goes, really. I mean, yeah, it kind of goes, but there must have been a better solution than that, really. Anyway, enough of that. That is where I'm going to call it because I think getting into any more really requires, I mean, the undercarriage separate assemblies probably do the ejection seat, but again, actually, just thinking of it, if I'm going to have the canopy closed, will you actually even see that rear bay? I may have just seen a shortcut, people. Nope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically, all of that is not going to be seen at all. Everything past there, if the... If the canopy is down, which I think I am going to put canopy down, is it going to be seen anyway? Well, there we go. I should have uh, I should have looked at that first, shouldn't I? <laughs> oh, what an idiot! Honestly, sometimes you should look ahead to what you're actually doing rather than uh, than just go slavishly step by step. Okay, so canopy down. No need to do this piece. <laughs> Well, that makes things a lot simpler. I don't know why they're not putting the ejection seat in, though, at this stage. Maybe I'll have a look at that next time. Right. OK, with that piece, I'm going to call it. I've obviously had too much of my zero alcohol beer. Because, um, <laughs> oh, my Lord, that's, uh, that's funny. So, well, that makes it very much easier um, in terms of the build, in terms of what I'm going to do. So next time, I think uh, I'll be getting this. Uh, I'll probably paint all of this um, off camera. And uh, the next time, hopefully, be a bit further on um, to actually put this together and see if we get those air intakes to align. But, um, but thank you guys for joining. Um, I hope you've enjoyed me <laughs> muddling through and making obvious errors. <laughs> um, 
I'd be interested to know what others who are building or going to build or have built this kit think of these air intake assemblies, because that to me is the weakest part of the kit so far. I think otherwise the kit holds up very, very well for a late seventies aircraft with, you know, additional parts. Um, yes, it has some simplifications, but overall, you know, the external pieces, which is really what you're going to see, uh, are pretty nicely molded. Um, you've got some good detail. These grills are very good, you know, for the, for the age. So I think it's going to look uh, like a nice kit. Obviously, we, we do have to deal with, with some big seams and stuff when we uh, when we finish actually putting things together. Um, but, yeah, that, that's par for the course, right? So, yeah, please do let me know what you, uh, what you think of those individual pieces, if you've got some experience of that, or uh, whether it's inspired you to do an F-15 yourself. Other than that... Thank you guys for joining. Have a great rest of your week, and I shall see you uh, either on the channel with a video or on the next um, live stream. So thank you very much, guys. Have a great evening. See you on the next one.